Good day, friends. Here we are, the first day, first Sunday in Advent. And so I think it's appropriate for me to say to each and every one, from me and my wife to you, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I hope this Christmas will be a time, this Advent season, I mean, will be a time for you to spend some focused time preparing your hearts and your minds to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this Christmas. So we're moving away from our, uh, for the next four weeks at least, into the new year. We're moving away from our former, from our series, our sermon series uh, in Psalm 119, and we're going to be focusing on Advent and then walk, walking into Christmas and then into the new year as well. And if you were uh, with me last week, uh, it was proposed then that the Christmas season presents the follower of Christ, that is you and me, with a number of tensions, cultural tensions. And one of the prominent realities we all face of our culture here in the West revolves around the consumption of goods and services during the Christmas season. We know and understand that the, the impact that Christmas season has on the economy it's a time when many small and even large businesses bring in, a large, bring in a large portion of their annual revenues. And the robust spending by consumers at Christmas brings a ripple effect to the larger economy of the country. And vice versa, the opposite is true. That is, less spending by consumers at Christmas also has a ripple effect into the larger economy. This is all about bottom lines and expenses and profits. And in some cases, whether a business will survive into the new year. But this begs a question as we begin this Advent uh, preparation. Have you ever wondered how much money people spend overall during the Christmas season? You might understand how much money you spend. You might know that, and I hope you know. But overall, well, Zipia.com after doing their research on the American holiday spending, revealed their findings based on 2022 Christmas shopping season. And the average spending in 2022 for each person in the States was $932. It seems that they're very specific here. And total gift spending in 2022 was $178 billion in the States. And when we consider the amount of money spent on gifts from 2006 to 2022, the amount had increased by 12.8%. And when we look at the overall picture, it is somewhat startling. For uh, the um, research revealed that one in three Americans said they will spend more than they can afford. And um, the numbers really do prove it. For the average indebted Christmas shopper will owe, on average, $1,200. Now here in Canada, before we stick up our uh, Canadian noses in the air and think we're better off, consider with me the average Canadian household debt in Canada, not including mortgage. So this is unsecured debt, credit cards, etc. If you have any guesses, fine, think about that, but the answer is somewhat startling, actually quite startling, $41,500 is the average Canadian household debt. And in April of 2022, Canadian household debt uh, was, in Canada, Canada-wide, was $2,116 billion. Wow, Canadians are buried alive in consumer debt. Someone once said that the Christmas season is often, quote, driven more by fear and obligation, manipulation and personal preference than goodwill toward men. And it's motivations like these that distort Christmas gift buying into some sort of appeasement offering. Well, with this in mind, let's turn to our text for today, which is found in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 12, and we'll be reading together from verse 13 to 21. Verse 13 to 21. Luke, chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is, so is the one, pardon me, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your message, your word. And we ask, O Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate this. And as we prepare now, as we spend some time, focus time, uh, in, in preparing ourselves for, through this Advent season for the celebration of your son who was born in a manger, we ask God that you would help us to really consider these things as we face even our own situ- situations in our own culture and our own families and friends and neighbors. And we want this to be something that brings you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. It was during the 1980s that multimillionaire um, Malcolm Forbes of Forbes, Mag- Forbes magazine coined the phrase, he who dies with the most toys win. And this popular phrase was found on car bumpers and in front of t-shirts. And while we seldom see these things uh, on bumper stickers or t-shirts proclaiming this ma- materialistic mantra today, the underlying philosophy and ideology, the spiritual rela- reality of this Uh, remains alive and well. It's just packaged differently. And this reality brings up some questions that you and me as followers of Christ are faced with during our Advent, Advent preparations. What does it mean to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah God in a consumeristic and materialistic culture? How do we live out the biblical story of Christmas to our families and friends and and uh, neighbors who often seemingly care more about the gift they give or receive than the gift of God born in a manger so long ago. How do we live out the biblical story of Christmas in our shopping, in our traveling, in our gift buying and giving, in the way we spend money and the way we accumulate debt this Christmas? Well, the parable that we just read would be a good place to start in putting together some answers to these questions and a way forward for you and me this Christmas season. So as we look at this text, uh, this text before us is typically referred to as the parable of the rich fool, or the rich landowner, finds itself among the exhortations of Jesus here immediately before concerning the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, scribes, and teachers of the day, the rulers, the religious rulers of the day of Jesus in Israel. And there Luke is recording the events and sayings of Jesus from a different perspective, of course, than the other Gospels. But we are reminded that Luke uh, told us, or said, in the very beginning of his Gospel, Luke chapter 1, verse 3, that he was preparing an orderly account. We want to camp around a little bit around Luke chapter 11, verse 37 to 53, to give us some context. We see here Jesus repeatedly making uh, beginning his comments to the Pharisees and scribes and teachers with this introductory phrase, Woe to you. You see this throughout here. They were not words of endearment, my friends. So in summary, Luke chapter 11, verse 37 uh, to 53 reveals to us what we see in today in many circles and sadly also in the church. The Pharisees and teachers and scribes Jesus called out had replaced the truth of the word of God with rules and regulations that God had not commanded anywhere in the Bible. In other words, they replaced the truth of God's word with their own selfish desires. There were things that they were neglecting. We see this in verse 42 of chapter 11. They were neglecting the justice and love of God. And in their pursuit of power and prominence, uh, we find that they had placed huge burdens on the people of God in that pursuit. And we see this in verse 46 of chapter 11. And after Jesus then had called out these religious rulers and teachers, we find, as we see here in chapter 12, as it begins, that large crowds began to gather around Jesus. And this was typical of Jesus' day, for Jesus was a popular 
popular person, and many people would follow Jesus and be around him in these times. But before he even looks at and addresses the, uh, the crowds, he turns to his disciples, because he still has the Pharisees and teachers and scribes on his mind, and he said to his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. And then moving on, we see Jesus exhorting uh, the disciples and the people uh, to, with the, the attitude we should have, this fear of God that we should have in the face of trials and tribulations. That's verse 4 to 5 in chapter 12. We also see the importance of the public acknowledgement of you and me publicly acknowledging the Messiahship, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and the Savior of the world publicly. And then we also see here a brief, convert, a brief uh, point on the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. This is in verse 8 to 12, verse uh, chapter 12. And then Jesus, as he was speaking, we find uh, someone just kind of blurts out, just kind of pops out of nowhere, it seems, and said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus answered the man, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Verse 14. Now, a few points need to be said here regarding Jesus' re uh, reply. It was typical, of course, in the days of Jesus, that Jews would go to a rabbi to settle disputes. This was... This was Often probably the case. However, the Torah, that is the book of the law, that is the first five books of our Old Testament in the Bible, would have been guiding authority in matters of civil law, such as inheritance. And in this situation, the right of the firstborn, as described in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17, would have been applied and required in the inheritance. For the eldest son would receive a double portion of the inheritance. This is the point. And while it may seem that there was a possible injustice happening here, that Jesus seemed to be unkind as he refused to mediate this family dispute, we need to understand that when we find these kinds of responses from Jesus in the New Testament, we need to apply the rule of good Bible interpretation. Interpretation. Context, context, context. My friends, Jesus wasn't being unkind. He was staying in his lanes. The Word of God, the Bible, reveals that one of the roles of, of Jesus Christ is that he is the judge of the whole world. He will come one day to judge all living things, all living people and dead. He'll judge the whole world. Jesus said of himself in John's Gospel, chapter 5, 22, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Why? Well, he continued to say that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father who sent him. John 5, verse 23. I mean, Jesus, friends, did not come to settle earthly disputes. This was a matter for the civil authorities. Jesus was staying in his lanes as the promised Messiah of God. And this brings us to verse 15. Now he turns to the crowds and he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. This word covetousness that the ESV has translated, the original word, can also be translated greed. And the meaning of the original Greek that Luke used in this context means exactly this, greed. This is a greedy desire to have more. And this meaning, as we think about it, can be applied in many places and ways in our own culture, in our own lives. But Jesus was being specific because he highlights possessions. So keeping with the context, Jesus is fresh from his condemnation uh, of the Pharisees who are motivated by greed, attacks greed directly. He attacks greed directly. Why? Why does Jesus feel the need to address this particular subject? One commentator said, quote, greed and the pursuit of possessions constitutes one of the greatest obstacles to spiritual growth. This is true. But friends, Greed is more than an obstacle to spiritual growth. Greed is an obstacle to a relationship with God. And we see this as Luke addresses this in a number of places in his gospel over and over. When G I'll give you a couple examples, a few examples. 
When Jesus was nearing the end of his 40 days of fasting in the Judean desert, Satan tempted Jesus to turn the stones into bread. And Jesus said to Satan, It is written, Man shall not come by bread alone, but by every, not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There, Jesus quoting from the Torah, Deuteronomy 8, chapter 3. And during Jesus' three years or so of ministry, many that followed him proclaimed their allegiance, that they were his disciples. But Jesus yet turned to them and said, If anyone would come after me, let me him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Friends, there are many obstacles to God. And always, it seems, the, oh, no, not seems, the underlying issue is found in the sinful human heart. And covetousness or greed, both are the, mean the same thing, which is common to all people in all places and all time is a serious obstacle to a relationship with God. King David understood this in a sense of wealth as well, when he said, If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Psalm 62.10 and the Bible warns us time after time again about greed in the New Testament. We see this in many places. Let me share a few of those places. Paul writing to the church in Rome in chapter 1, when he considers the unrepented uh, uh, folk there in, in Rome, the, that God had brought their, his judgment on them, he said this as well. They were filled, these unrepented unbelievers with all manners of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, greed, malice. Romans chapter 1 verse 29. Writing to the church in Ephesus, uh, Paul there speaking about uh, encouraging them to exhort them to be imitators of God, said this about what they should not have even amongst them at all. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you as is proper among saints. Ephesians 5, chapter 3. Uh, see, Ephesians 5, verse 3. And then we go to the letter he wrote to Colossae, the Colossians. There he has uh, greed in this list. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Colossians 3, verse 5. And one more. In his letter to Corinthian church, his first letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. You know, Paul was dealing with a lot of serious things happening in that church. He said to them, do not be deceived, for the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he provides another list there. And amongst that list is the greedy. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Greed is an obstacle to a relationship with God. Moving on to verse 16 to 20, we see, as we just read together just moments ago, Jesus tells one of his many parables that we find in all four gospels. Now, uh, now, time is not on our side to deal fully with how and why Jesus taught with parables, but suffice it to uh, say, at least we have a good definition. Harper's Bible Dictionary defines biblical parables as, quote, parables are very short stories with a double meaning. Another commentator defines Jesus' parables as, quote, stories that, were, that uh, were cast alongside a truth in order to illustrate the truth. So here in our text, we have one of Jesus' parables that he used to illustrate a truth, the parable of the rich fool. Let's read that parable together again. Starting in verse uh, 16. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store, store all my grain and goods. And my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have... Prepare, have prepared, whose will they be? Whose will they be? You know, this is a story of a miser who, who loved his money more than just about anything else. And just before he died, he asked his wife uh, to place all his money in the casket with him. 
You see, he wanted to take all his money with him into the afterlife. So he got his wife to promise him. Well, the fateful day arrived, and there he was, stretched out in the casket, with his wife sitting there in black. And when the ceremony was finished, just before the casket was closed, she placed a shoebox in the casket, and then the casket was closed. Later on, uh, her friend asked, asked, uh, asked her, I hope you weren't crazy enough to put all the money in there with that stingy old man. And she replied, yes, I promised. I'm a good Christian. I can't lie. I promised him that I was going to put that money in the casket with him. And her friend replied, you mean to tell me you put every cent of his money in the casket with him? And the wife said, I sure did. I got it all together, put it in my bank account, and I wrote him a check. You see, just like the rich miser who tried to take all his money into the afterlife with him, the rich landowner of Jesus' parable reveals his miserly heart. While on the surface, you and I might say that the landowner was wise to deal with his bumper crop in the way he did, it was his desire, his attitude, that was a problem, for he said to himself, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Verse 19. Please notice the personal pronouns that Luke uses in the text. Verse 17. What shall I do? Verse 18. I will store all my grain. Verse 19. I will say to my soul, I do, I will, I do. See, there's nothing in the landowner's language and attitude that reveals any awareness of stewardship or responsibility toward others. Paul, writing to his dear friend and co-pastor, uh, Timothy, who was pastoring the, at this time of this letter, the church in Ephesus, and in that church there were rich people, we know this, said this to Timothy to tell the church, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be proud, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share that story up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Back to our parable. No sooner than the landowner uh, said to his own soul, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you in the things you prepared, whose will they be? Verse 20. So in a moment, all that the landowner had accomplished, all the hard work of ensuring his abundant crops would be harvested was for nothing. Notice the phrase, your soul is required of you. God said to this landowner, your soul is required of you. My friends, this is a language of obligation. You see, the landowner was only interested in himself, his accomplishments, his successes. His attitude revealed his blind spots, his foolishness. For indeed, the landowner owed his very life, his business, his wealth, his eternal destination to God. The landowner owed his very soul to God. And the greater tragedy is that the landowner, landowner, I'm starting to lose my voice here, lived his life with no awareness of eternity. With all his business wisdom, he was unwise in his preparation for eternity. Someone Someone once said about possessions, quote, possessions are like light beer. They may taste great, but they are really less filling. I just want to be clear. Jesus was not saying the possessions are bad but he was saying there are less filling. One day, there's another story from Luke's Gospel. One day, uh, one of the religious rulers of Israel, a Pharisee, went to see Jesus during the evening watches. Of course, he couldn't go see him during the day or else people would ask him why. But anyways, I digress. He had one question for Jesus, and this was a really good question. He asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Jesus reminded the ruler of the commandments. He said, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And the ruler replied, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus replied to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have a treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. So how did this rich ruler respond? 
When he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely wealthy. And then Jesus said this, how difficult it is for those with wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 18, 24. Back to our text. Jesus finished his parable, turned to the crowd, and basically said the same thing he said to the rich ruler, just in a different way. He said, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Verse 21. Here is the biblical truth in the parable of the rich fool. So, so may I ask you, does God want your money? He doesn't need your money, but does he want your money, your possessions, your wealth? Does God want you to not buy a gift for your wife this Christmas or for your grandchild or for a friend? Does God expect you to sell all you have and give it away? No. But maybe yes. One of the most popular Christmas stories for a long time is the Christmas Carol. We are introduced to a miserly man, Ebenezer Scrooge. Dickens describes Scrooge in this way. As squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Christmas to this grasping, clutching, covetous Scrooge was a humbug. Then beginning with a visit from his deceased partner in business, Jacob Marley, on Christmas Eve, then the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, the ghost, the dreaded ghost of Christmas future, this once squeezing, scraping Scrooge wakes up Christmas morning a changed man. And Dickens writes, quote, it was always said of him, that is Scrooge, that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. How do we live out the biblical story of Christmas? in our shopping, in our traveling, in our gift buying and giving, in the way we spend money, in the way we accumulate debt at Christmas. May I suggest in your Advent preparation that you seriously consider this question and push into it and answer it for yourself. And maybe start with by answering another most important question. Are you saved? Are you born again? Have you surrendered, your, have you repented and surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, who paid for all your sins, once for all. Have you done that? Because if you haven't done that, any other effort is for naught. Or maybe, may I suggest, by spending some time with Luke chapter 1 and 2, ponder it, slow down, look through it, and include in your preparation Matthew 1 and 2, along with Luke 1 and 2. Prayerfully and carefully take in the biblical story of Christmas. Christmas. Do this before you go out shopping. Or attend the staff Christmas party. Or buy a gift. Or give the gift. Or spend your money. Or incur debt. You know, friends, you won't regret it. And you'll begin to live out the biblical story of Christmas, this Christmas season, in our time. Lord, I thank you for this message. I thank you, Lord, for Christmas. Oh, Lord, at the right time, in the right place, the right moment, you sent your one and only son into the world as a baby. And when he comes again, he will come as the conquering Messiah. And all things will be made right. And all things will be placed in the proper place. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and the people of God will be there with our Lord and Savior forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me. Again, Merry Christmas. Shalom.